Today, we are going to cover three true scary stories from the perspectives of the people who encountered these horrific situations. Viewer discretion is advised as these stories can be unsettling. Without further ado, let's get going. Welcome to the Scare Zone. This incident occurred two years ago during my employment with a prominent carpet cleaning company. As expected, my daily cleaning using various tools and equipment. Despite being a 22-year-old female, I was one of the few women working in this predominantly male field. Surprisingly, I found great satisfaction in my work and I excelled at it. Given my competence, I was assigned an extensive workload, often covering six to eight houses across multiple towns in a day. On this particular occasion, I found myself working late due to an unexpectedly time-consuming prior appointment. By the time I reached my last job of the day, it was around 7 p.m. To my dismay, the address turned out to be in a remote location, and no one was home upon my arrival. Although annoyed at the situation, I recognized that it was my own fault for running late. I decided to wait for the residents to return since leaving without conducting any cleaning would have resulted in a reprimand from my boss. Thankfully, my patience paid off, and approximately 10 minutes later, the homeowner arrived in his van. He was a middle-aged man, balding, dressed in weathered shorts and a jacket. His demeanor seemed somewhat awkward, but he apologized for the delay and allowed me access to his impeccably clean house, complete with the fragrance of recently used cleaning supplies. It struck me as strange to encounter carpets already in pristine condition upon entering. I genuinely questioned whether my cleaning efforts would make a noticeable difference. However, adhering to company protocol, I retrieved my company laptop to calculate the service cost before commencing work. Unexpectedly, the homeowner posed a peculiar question. Does that thing track your location? His question caught me off guard, raising a red flag in my mind. After recovering from the initial surprise, I responded with a lie, assuring him that the laptop indeed tracked my whereabouts, and my boss had full knowledge of the expected duration for each job. In truth, the laptop's sole purpose was to calculate customer charges based on the entered workload, but I sensed something peculiar about this person, necessitating my dishonesty. Regardless, I began the cleaning task with the intention of finishing quickly and calling it a day. Approximately an hour later, I was done. In a rush, I approached the client to inform him of the completion and the amount owed. However, he interrupted me and requested that I also clean his basement carpet, which he had forgotten to include initially. I felt a pang of disappointment, but couldn't find a way to decline due to my commitment to customer service. Reluctantly, I followed the client to the basement entrance. As I descended, my eyes widened with horror. The basement was in a dismal state compared to the rest of the house. It lacked carpeting, with seven deep freezers along the walls. A dimly lit ceiling light revealed an old television set, VHS tapes scattered across the floor, and an aging recliner positioned in front of the TV. Behind the set, two white shelves held more VHS tapes. While I examined the basement, the client ominously stood at the top of the stairs, blocking the exit with a disturbing smile. Feeling uneasy, I glanced up at him and suggested that I retrieve my equipment. In reality, I had no intention of cleaning anything. My only desire was to escape. Holding my breath, I ascended the stairs, but the client remained blocking the doorway, still wearing that unsettling smile. I stood there for a brief moment, hoping he would move aside. Then, I could swear I heard footsteps behind me in the basement. Without hesitation, fueled by instinct and adrenaline, I charged towards the client, managing to break free and sprint out of the front door to my parked van. Leaving behind thousands of dollars worth of cleaning equipment, I cared only about my own safety. As I drove away, I stole a final glance at the house, catching sight of the man peering out of one of the windows. His expression had transformed from a smile to a cold, penetrating stare. I was under the impression that another individual was present, although now I am uncertain. The entirety of the memory remains hazy to me. The truth is, my absence would have gone unnoticed by my boss for a minimum of 24 hours, as I failed to appear for my shift the following day. The subsequent morning, I contacted my boss and disclosed everything, ultimately resigning on that very day. To the best of my knowledge, the authorities were alerted, but I make an effort to distance myself from the entire ordeal. 
Consequently, I am unaware of the ultimate outcome. This experience has left me with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and that day continues to haunt me. The inexplicable discovery in that basement, coupled with the eerie sound of footsteps trailing behind me, leads me to firmly believe that the man and others present had malicious intentions to end my life that night for some unsettling motive or another. During my early teenage years around the age of 14, I found myself employed at various gas stations in my small hometown. In this close-knit community, where everybody knew each other, the store owners didn't mind me lending a hand with tasks like buffing the floors, restocking the coolers, and even operating the register on occasion, all for a modest sum of money. This was all taking place back in the early 90s in Florida, one fateful night when the clock struck 11 p.m. I recall sitting at my usual spot, a table positioned alongside the gas station windows. During those nights, I would spend a significant amount of time engrossed in books, interrupting my reading only to tend to different chores. Considering my tender age of 14, it was apparent that I wasn't permitted to single-handedly manage the store. Usually, a manager or another employee or two would be present alongside me. However, on this particular evening, I found myself partnering with a guy named Jeff. Jeff was one of the part-time managers, and whenever it was just the two of us, he would typically retreat to the back, leaving me to hold down the fort alone. The night in question was no exception. As I sat behind the register, my attention was abruptly seized by something rather peculiar. I noticed a lady making her way up the parking lot from the direction of the nearby interstate. It was highly unusual because our parking lot was virtually deserted and pedestrian traffic this way was an uncommon occurrence. Located in the middle of nowhere, with desolation characterizing our surroundings, it was highly unlikely for anyone to stroll down that road. My assumption was that she must have experienced a vehicular breakdown and sought assistance, such as procuring a gas container or using our phone to summon a tow truck. Observing her for about a minute, I realized she hadn't brought any container with her. Subsequently, she entered the store and began perusing the aisles for a few minutes. The overall situation felt eerie, and I distinctly remember getting an unsettling vibe from her mere presence and the way she surveyed the store. At this point, Jeff emerged from the back and joined me behind the register, a routine he followed whenever customers arrived. The lady approached the counter and initiated a conversation, recounting a tale about her car breaking down and her dire need for a ride to a town I had never even heard of before. Jeff promptly responded, stating that he was occupied at work and unable to accommodate her request. As the manager, he couldn't leave me alone. At that moment, the lady turned her gaze towards me, anticipating my reply. Without uttering a word, I glanced back at Jeff, who met my eyes with an icy stare, subtly shaking his head to indicate his disapproval. I took this as confirmation that he sensed something was awry about this woman. Before I could even respond, she redirected her attention to Jeff and gestured towards me, inquiring if I could assist her. With firmness and urgency, Jeff swiftly denied her plea, citing my age as the main reason for his refusal. I didn't contest Jeff's decision on my behalf, as this behavior was entirely out of character for him. Normally affable and talkative with customers, his reaction reinforced the idea that he had suspicions about the lady. Clearly infuriated, she hurled expletives at us before storming off, retreating back towards the parking lot. I kept a watchful eye on her as she reached the far end, right next to the interstate. Notably, she engaged in a phone conversation and after a brief wait, a car pulled up beside her, seemingly anticipating her arrival. The entire situation was undeniably peculiar, but I only grasped the extent of the danger I had unknowingly faced that night much later. Almost a year after the incident, it was nighttime, and as I drifted off to sleep in my bedroom, the television played softly in the background. I couldn't recall the channel, perhaps a news station. Suddenly, a fragment of dialogue from the television jolted me awake. I sat upright, fixing my gaze on the screen where I was confronted with the mugshot of a woman. Immediately, I recognized her as the same lady who had been in the store with me almost a year ago, attempting to entice either me or my manager to drive her into town. There was no doubt in my mind that it was the exact same woman. It later surfaced that she was Eileen Warnos, 
a serial killer convicted of murdering seven men. Adeline would allure her victims to isolated locations, mercilessly shooting them at close range. What haunts me the most is how perilously close I came to becoming one of her victims. Reflecting on her behavior in the store and what I now know about her, I firmly believe her intentions were to murder either me or my manager, Jeff, that very night. Before we get into number one, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying this video and want to see more like this one. This incident occurred during the summer of 2017 when my wife and I had recently tied the knot. Due to the expenses from our wedding, our financial situation wasn't at its best, which led us to settle for an inexpensive boarding house. This three-story house had four rooms, a shared kitchen, and a bathroom for all residents. After moving into a room on the second floor, we realized that we would be sharing the house with other people, notably a couple named Jim and Jennifer, who occupied the room above us on the third floor. During our three-month stay, Jim and Jennifer were the only neighbors we interacted with. Despite our similar age and interests, our conversations were brief, often limited to passing greetings or exchanging words on the front porch while enjoying a cigarette. As time went on, we noticed that their relationship was strained. It began with occasional yelling matches and the occasional late-night departure from the house in anger. However, these short-lived arguments gradually intensified in both volume and duration. One night, my wife and I were watching a movie and, as usual, we could hear the escalating fights above us. However, just as the movie concluded, a strange occurrence took place. Their quarrels abruptly ceased. Although the sudden silence brought some relief, it was highly unusual considering their consistent arguments, especially at that late hour. Despite our surprise, we decided to seize the quietude and attempt to sleep. Fortunately, we managed to drift off, only for me to be awakened in the middle of the night by my trembling wife. Groggy and disoriented, I couldn't comprehend the time or reason for being roused from my slumber. As I turned over to get up, I noticed a man standing beside our bed, hunching over my nightstand, rummaging through the drawer. Astonished, our eyes met, and he straightened up, fixating his gaze upon me. I woke up abruptly, finding myself sitting on my bed. As I scanned the room, I noticed a figure slowly backing away. Was it real or just my imagination? Switching on the room's lamp, I realized it was our neighbor Jim from upstairs. This was the same Jim who kept us up late with his constant yelling. Relief washed over me, but I couldn't shake off the confusion as to why he was rummaging through our belongings while we slept. It was completely out of character for him. Taking a deep breath to gather myself, I mustered the courage to ask Jim what he was doing in our room. Silence loomed for a few seconds, and then Jim asked if he could borrow our car, or if we could give him a ride somewhere. My wife, who had awoken by now, sternly yelled at him, refusing his request. After all, this was the same person who had broken into her room at three in the morning. She threatened to call the police if he didn't leave. In response to her words, Jim quickly sprinted out of the room, not just the room, but straight out the front door and down the street, disappearing into the night. A strange feeling consumed both my wife and me. Something was undeniably off about the entire situation. We decided we had to check on Jim's wife, Jennifer, who lived in the apartment above ours. Reluctantly, we climbed the stairs and found the door to Jennifer's room closed but unlocked. My wife suggested we leave her alone, but my intuition told me otherwise. Giving into my curiosity, I lightly knocked on the door and called out in the usual manner. Silence echoed back urging us to venture further. Slowly, we turned the doorknob and pushed open the door. What transpired next was straight out of a horror movie. The room appeared as if a frenzy of chaos had occurred, with random spots brutally marked by who knows what. To our utmost horror, we saw Jennifer lying face down on the floor. We approached cautiously, assuming that Jim had caused her harm. However, as we came closer, noticed fresh blood seeping into the carpet beneath her lifeless body. Panic set in, and we immediately dialed emergency services. We conveyed our belief that we had stumbled upon a murder scene, but the perpetrator had already fled. Police instructed us to leave the room and wait outside until their arrival, promising to be there within moments. True to their word, the police arrived in less than five minutes. We narrated the events of that night in full detail, urging them to locate Jim. 
Thankfully, they succeeded in apprehending him about an hour later as he continued running down the street. After engaging in additional discussions with law enforcement authorities, it became apparent that Jin's intent was to locate a gas station in order to procure fuel for the purpose of setting the entire residence ablaze with the objective of complete destruction of Jennifer's dead body. This would lead to the elimination of all traces that could link him to the murder. Eventually, Jim was convicted for the murder of his own wife. For the next few days, my wife and I were confined to our house, besieged by numerous journalists who sought interviews. As soon as we managed to gather the necessary funds, we promptly relocated. Yet the entire experience was extraordinarily chilling. Imagine encountering, unbeknownst, a man in the dead of night who had just committed matricide and was ultimately plotting our demise to cover his tracks. If you would like to share a true scary story with us and be featured in a future episode, please check out the details in the description. In the meantime, watch more of our videos.